China's role as the powerhouse for world economic growth. And this will create growth opportunities for all countries. China has become a major powerhouse for world economic growth, having been the biggest contributor to world growth for 14 years in a row. Despite the impact of the profound changes and seen in the century and difficulties caused by the pandemic, China's economy has shown strong resilience and vitality. It will surely play a bigger role in driving global growth. In China's 14th five-year plan, the Greater Bay Area is clearly defined as a pioneering region, leading high-quality development and one of the key regions to develop a rich source for innovation and better capacity in global resources allocation. The Greater Bay Area will be a land of opportunities for high-quality growth in the next five years. Among the world's four Great Bay Areas, the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area has distinctive strengths in terms of economic aggregate, growth potential, and market scale. The economic aggregate of the Greater Bay Area was about 1.7 trillion US dollars at the end of 2020. Studies in China also show, show that this will reach 4.6 trillion US dollars in 2030, the highest among the world's Bay Areas. The Greater Bay Area comprises the most competitive cities in the region and has an industrial mix of advanced manufacturing, high technology, financial services, and modern services. In the past four years, the Greater Bay Area has seen continued improvement in research, development, and innovation capacity. It is gathering greater influence as an international center of science, technology, and innovation. High-tech and new industry clusters have emerged. Inter-regional cooperation and sharing of technologies have accelerated product upgrading and lowered costs. By sharing its industrial demand, innovation experience, and development bonus with the broad international market, the Greater Bay Area will create more opportunities for countries of the world in terms of market, investment, and growth. Second, as part of China's efforts to build a new economic system with a higher level of opening up, the Greater Bay Area will offer a more enabling business environment. The favorable policies will release more opportunities for companies from all over the world. In recent years, China has accelerated the pace of improving the business environment. It has been listed by the World Bank as one of the world's top 10 most improved economies for ease of doing business for two years in a row. The Greater Bay Area is a test field for building a new economic system with a higher level of opening up. Since its launch, it has focused on fostering a business environment that is up to advanced international standards in terms of the rule of law, supporting infrastructure, and efficiency of administrative services. The regulation and rules are compatible with advanced economic and trade rules of the international market. Its goal is to build a high standard business environment that is stable, fair, transparent, and predictable. In the past four years, business registration and administrative review and approval and gone through reforms. Much progress has been made in fostering a modern international and law-based business environment. 
the cost of the real economy has been significantly lowered and great improvement has been made in trade facilitation. Third, as an increasingly important platform for international cooperation on the Belt and Road Initiative, the Greater Bay Area is creating opportunities for win-win results. Under the principles of extensive consultation, joint contribution and shared benefits, BRI promotes the cooperation of all partners in a free, inclusive, and equal trade system. This initiative has won extensive recognition and warm response from all participating countries. The Greater Bay Area is on the frontier of China's opening up. As the important starting point of the Maritime Silk Road and an important hub on the Belt and Road routes, this area is becoming an increasingly important platform for international cooperation on BRI and has created enormous opportunities and tangible benefits to participating countries and regions. The Greater Bay Area has world's largest airport cluster and three of the world's top 10 container ports. It has built a multi-dimensional network of transport infrastructure and will take further measures to facilitate the efficient movement of personnel, goods, and other factors. In the financial sector, the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect and other relevant measures have greatly improved the connectivity of financial markets and the cross border flow of capital. It is expected that more funds will be channeled to key areas such as roads, railways, ports, bridges, and power grids. This will boost international cooperation on production capacity, which in turn will drive the economic growth of BRI partners and enable all parties to share opportunities and achieve win-win results through open cooperation. The Greater Bay Area is always a priority choice for many British businesses who want access to the Chinese market. It is my hope that more business of our two countries will engage in deeper collaboration, enhance cooperation in innovation, commercialization of research results, green finance, smart cities, international shipping, modern services, ecological conservation, and sustainable development, and explore new spaces and opportunities in trade and investment, healthcare, and cultural and creative industries. China and Britain can also tap the potential of the synergy between China's development and opening up policies, such as the development of the Greater Bay Area and the UK's strategies, including the development of free ports and northern powerhouse. By matching the possibilities offered by these policies, China and Britain can produce new outcomes. The Greater Bay Area is also a platform for Belt and Road and third market cooperation. Businesses of our two countries can work together on programs that offer financing, expertise, and services so as to bring benefits to more countries and peoples along the BRI routes. Last week, at a virtual dialogue with UK business leaders, Premier Li Keqiang stressed that reform and opening up is China's basic national policy. China will continue to pursue this policy unswervingly. China's market is open to all partners from all countries. The opportunities of the Greater Bay Area and China's development and opening up are enormous. We are also ready to work with the rest of the world to achieve common development. So in conclusion, I wish this webinar great success. Thank you.
Thank you, Minister Young. Pleasure to have you with us and uh, for an interesting speech. I was impressed uh, with your uh, overview of the, the China-UK angle, but also that you said that the Greater Bay Area was open to everyone. and We, we really do see that as a, as a regional and global opportunity. Um, I was also impressed by the figures that you quoted that the Greater Bay Area at the end of 2020 last year had a GDP of 1.7 trillion US dollars and that that is expected to grow to 4.6 trillion dollars uh, by the by 2030. That's a growth rate of 150 percent, over 150 percent in the next decade. Very, very impressive uh, figures. Minister Young, uh, thank you very much for your contribution today. Much appreciated. I'd now like to uh, hand over to uh, Alberto Vettoretti. Alberto is a managing partner for Deason Shearer and Associates in Hong Kong uh, and, uh, and indeed for China. Alberto has been with the firm in Asia for over 20 years. Um, as I mentioned, he's now based in Hong Kong from where he overviews uh, the firm's activities and our clients' investments in China, Hong Kong, ASEAN. Alberto was educated at the University of Durham uh, spent several years as a deputy chair for Eurocham in South China and has been an advisor to the mayor of Shenzhen. Alberto, over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, it's a honor to be here. Good morning uh, to the UK and good afternoon to all of us uh, here in Asia. I'm particularly happy today to share some insights about uh, the Greater Bay Area, an area I know fairly well, having lived and worked in this part of the world for over uh, 23 years. Um, next slide, please. As Stephen Perry uh, alluded to in his initial remarks, uh, there are three, now four, with a corridor of Chongqing and Chengdu mega clusters which are going to drive China's urbanizations and economic development over the next few years. If you look at the Great Bay Area, and I refer to the top left uh, corner graph, you see the smallest dot only representing 1% of the total China territory and only 5% of its population. What is staggering about the GBA is this 5% population can generate in excess of 12% of its GDP and 25% of its total economic output, just to give you uh, a share size of what the GBA has become uh, these days. This is made been possible through nine cities in the mainland, as well as the two special administrative region in Macau and Hong Kong. For those of you less familiar with the area, um, I thought it would be quite interesting to draw an interesting parallelism with the UK. Uh, if you can imagine, the entire UK population, and on top of that, you add the medium-sized European country, you pack all these people in the provinces in the south, southeast, west, and east of the UK, you add an international financial center, London, you give them the best in class facilities and infrastructure, and this gives you a good idea about what the GBA is uh, today. The GBA is young, uh, the average working age, as you can see in the graph, is uh, very low compared to other cities and areas in, in China. It's still relatively unurbanized. There is still lots of space for uh, development. And it's not only young, um, it's also smart. Hong Kong boosts uh, four of the top 100 universities, and there are lots of uh, research and development centers across the Bay, several hundreds incubators. So it's also a very smart location. But that's not enough. The GBA is also extremely rich and is getting richer. If you look at disposable income per capita, uh, if you look at the GDP uh, per person, this is now in par uh, with the UK. And you have certain cities like Macau, for example, which is second only to Switzerland and Luxembourg in terms of GDP per capita. And again, that's not enough because it's still growing. Since the late 70s, when Deng Xiaoping came down the south and pronounced those very famous words, to get rich is glorious, it doesn't matter uh, what color the cat is as long as you catch mice, the GBA is still growing. Next slide, please. 
And where has that led to? Uh, if you look at the graph on the left side, and uh, Mr. Young alluded to this uh, uh, in his early remarks, the GBA currently jostle neck to neck with Canada, Italy um, in, in number 11 in terms of ranking if the GBA was considered uh, a country on its own right. What is more important and it was more interesting is the fact that by 2030, if you look at national uh, uh, projections and if you look at uh, IMF projections, the GBA will cruise its way right into the 3.5 trillion GDP mark, which will put that right uh, uh, after uh, Germany. I think that's quite impressive and it's not surprising that that isn't the way to be achieved from what we see uh, on the ground. So what, what are the, the re, um, the recipes of, uh, of these uh, uh, great achievements and the ingredients for, for its success. If we look at the other uh, two charts on the right side of your screen, uh, I've put uh, uh, some notable UK cities as well, the 11 cities in the GBA. What you can see is the fact they are so diverse from one to the other. You've got uh, cities like uh, Macau, like Hong Kong, where services is, more, is, is almost 100% of their GDP. And then the more you venture into the GBA, you see cities like uh, um, Shenzhen, Dongguan, Zhongshan, where manufacturing is 50% uh, of um, the GDP which is generated. I don't have really time to pick all the cities, but I would like to share something with you about Shenzhen. Uh, a city I know uh, quite well, which recently celebrated its 40th uh, anniversary. What Shenzhen has achieved uh, over the past um, several years is, uh, is truly unbelievable. Um, the bold statement in terms of uh, having all its buses and cars uh, being electrical, uh, the fact that it um, invests 5% of its GDP in research and development, 50% um, of all patents registered in China are indeed in Shenzhen, are just some showcase of uh, what Shenzhen has really become over the past uh, 40 years. And that's not enough because next to it, you have got uh, Hong Kong, which uh, is really the place where you can access capital to internationalize your businesses uh, and also to invest into uh, the GBA. And then we go into other cities like Dongguan, for example, which has really benefited by the spillover effect, uh, given the fact that the land in Shenzhen was so limited industries had to expand into uh, Dongguan and now it's become a really world-beating class uh, manufacturing cluster and of course Guangzhou uh, where uh, all the trading and where all the cultural center are which um, are important to or orchestrate all the efforts uh, of uh, the GBA. So where are all these uh, uh, important factors uh, leading to? Next slide, please. As Mr. Young alluded to in his uh, previous remarks, um, nine of the 10 top uh, container ports are now in Asia. And this is no surprise because uh, roughly 52% of the world manufacturing output is now in Asia. So this gives you really an idea about the world economic dynamo being shifting from the West over uh, to the East. Within those uh, nine ports, three of them are within the GBA. Shenzhen Yantian port on its own rights is um, the world largest port. And that is not uh, enough. The air freight traffic, which is generated in the GBA, is greater than the combined figure by all the other bays, San Francisco Bay, Tokyo, and New York Bay uh, lumped together. Hong Kong also is the largest cargo hub. So this is just an idea to show again the manufacturing power of this uh, region. If you look at uh, uh, the right side, then you can see how in between Hong Kong, which is still a reinvoicing center for the region, Shenzhen, Dongguan, and Guangzhou, there is over 1 trillion US dollars of export being generated uh, from those areas. Obviously, quite a bit of that goes to uh, the UK. Uh, China is Britain's uh, third largest trading partner at the moment, and was even first trading partner in the first quarter. Again, this is where things are uh, being made. Next slide, please. But that's enough with charts. And uh, again, I, I want to refer to Stephen Perry's earlier comments about uh, taking one day on a train from Hong Kong venturing into the Pearl River Delta 
perhaps now that journey would take 20 minutes or thereabouts. So I thought I would give you uh, a vision about what the Per River Delta and the GBA is right now. I've put together um, um, all uh, train lines, metro lines, bridges, news and being built, all the international airports as well as the ports. I haven't um, written down only highways and roads, otherwise the picture would get quite uh, messy, but this gives you just an idea about the two hours circle. So you can travel now from one corner to the other of the GBA within two hours through bullet trains, uh, very fast connections. And this is amazing because you can still um, uh, think of the fact that you're still under one country free systems by the time you had Macau and uh, Hong Kong. So really crossing uh, the border is being really made easy and we all look forward after um, we resume uh, operations and cross uh, boundaries uh, in the aftermath of COVID to make the journey even smoother. So what are the re reasons really and the secret ingredients of this uh, uh, success uh, in the GBA? Of course, you have an amazing infrastructure, you have uh, a vertically integrated uh, supply chain, you have an ecosystem pushed by this um, China's um, will to generate new activities through a 5G or even 6G push. So this is helping to generate an incredible ecosystem where you can, from design, from R&D, move to mass market within a two-hour circle which is um, unknown of uh, anywhere else in, uh, in the world. Um, you have education, you have some of the best universities in the world, you have um, an important ecosystem, you have more than one million graduates every year to fill into that uh, uh, supply chain. But what stands out, in my opinion, uh, comparing the GBA and other macro clusters is the fact that private sector really has the lion's share in terms of economic output. Um, the GBA is generating so many entrepreneurs, all the new billionaires which are being generated uh, uh, happen to, um, to be based uh, over here. Policies have always been very supportive in the GBA, uh, from tax to incentives to develop um, uh, high-tech products, uh, um, as I mentioned before, the land is limited and uh, urbanization is still going on. So um, locations like Shenzhen or even Hong Kong, they really have to go vertical and add value to their manufacturing process. So all the low end is sort of moving away as part of this uh, dual circulation plan as well. And um, all the added value services are staying uh, obviously behind. A geographical also advantage, um, as you can see, you can really reach uh, Southeast Asia in, in a couple of hours, and uh, I'm sure Chris will uh, uh, mention that in his presentation later on. Next slide, please. So hopefully by now you have an idea about what uh, the, the, the GBA is in terms of uh, uh, potential and uh, the world beating economic and manufacturing center it is. In this slide, I've taken away all the bridges, all the MTRs and all the railway stations, and I've added instead all Fortune 500 companies, uh, including those from the UK, which have a presence in, uh, uh, in the GBA. Interestingly enough, uh, this year, uh, Chinese companies actually have the lion's shares of Fortune 500 companies. I think there are 134 at the last count and uh, uh, increasing. Companies like uh, Pingang, uh, for example, now have become the largest insurance company. You might recognize the DJI logo uh, in, uh, in Shenzhen. Huawei, as well as BYD, which is the largest uh, e-vehicle uh, company uh, in the world. So all these companies could not have been developed to such an extent unless there was such an nurturing business environment. This has also attracted uh, foreign companies. And uh, you can see uh, those from the UK with a little Union Jack on the, on the top uh, right corner. Um, and also what you can see is also unicorns. The GBA, uh, which is actually very interesting, is the larger producer of unicorns uh, to date. Um, 50 recently have been um, established and are growing in the, in the UK. And all of them are looking at the capital by venturing uh, in Hong Kong and overseas. So really being here in the GBA is extremely important for UK companies and uh, the opportunities for UK businesses are highlighted in light gray. I think there are 
quite a few of them uh, worth uh, mentioning. But I think what is important and the point I really want to make is the opportunities are really here in terms of selling into the GBA. As I mentioned before, it's an extremely rich um, uh, part of, uh, of China. It is growing. Uh, making here for selling into China is also a, a common strategy to get into the market. And even more importantly, because China is signing, is signing up so many free trade agreements uh, with ASEAN and it's part of uh, RCEP, making stuff here to sell into uh, other markets is uh, uh, again becoming extremely important. Uh, last but not least, as mentioned by Mr. Yang, from here you can also partner up with international companies which want to expand beyond the GBA and venture into the larger Belt and Road Initiative. And on that note, I think I'll uh, give the mic back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Alberto. I, I really liked the map of, um, of the GBA with all the bridges and roads, uh, well, not the roads, but the, the bullet trains and the, uh, all that interconnectivity is, uh, is quite amazing. You can travel around it in two hours. That would be a hell of a pub crawl, wouldn't it? Anyway, um, to move, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, we're going to drill down a bit now in this um, in this seminar, um, and I know that uh, our next two speakers, uh, Henry Tillman of China Investment Research and Julia Charlton of Charles Law Firms, have some uh, have some uh, specific slides to share with you. Now, Henry is going to be talking about the health sick road. I'm going to introduce him properly in a minute. Uh, but um, uh, the slides that he has uh, have proprietary data on them. Uh, they will not be shared publicly after this event. But Henry has kindly uh, offered that if you do wish to share, if you do wish to have that data, then you can, um, you can use your uh, screensaver to, uh, to capture his slides. Um, and the same with Julia afterwards. Uh, so please, if you do want to capture the slides from these coming presentations with proprietary uh, and extremely valuable data, then use your screen savers to do so. Henry Tillman is the chairman of China Investment Research, uh, a uh, boutique firm that specializes in data analysis of Chinese outbound investment. Henry has over 35 years experience as an international banker with specific interest in China. Uh, and his previous roles have included senior executive positions within uh, BZW and ABN AMRO. He's a highly respected, highly regarded uh, China analyst. Uh, Henry, over to you. Thank you very much. Let me just get this loaded up, please. Thank you. So um, for all, uh, what I'm going to show you today is uh, of some interim work, uh, what I'm doing with um, this is the Shanghai Institute of International Studies um, and with um, Shanghai University. So we had just published a piece in February of this year on the 2020 developments of the Hell Silk Road. Uh, we are in the process of updating that through the, through the end of H1 2021. And when Chris asked me to do this, I then uh, wanted to um, use this, but also just talk about what uh, Minister Wang had mentioned before the importance of the GBA in respect to financial services, biotech, and innovation. So I have so much to cover. This is roughly a 45-minute presentation. I need to do in 15 minutes, so I must canter along. But this data is meant to um, give facts to people who want to live, live with rumors, unfortunately. So the, the first thing I want to show you is basically facts related to vaccines needed. So as you all know, it's 11 billion, the number, that's WHO number, and their affinity number. Um, and um, the goal, I will show you the numbers for the full year coming up. The, uh, the, uh, the goal was in earlier this year was for India to lead with a billion doses foreign uh, for, for, the, for the world. And of course, when India imploded with its own problems at the end of April, May, that didn't happen. So uh, currently by the end of 2021, you should see a number of these countries, six of these countries, that are basically keeping large amounts of surpluses. Uh, and we'll talk about that a bit later. And those six jurisdictions represent 90% of the excess uh, so doses manufactured by the end of 2021, which we talk about later. Here are the numbers. So 
um, and this is all it's all moving because this is aggressively growing market. So the doses, the non-Chinese doses this year, 10.2 billion this year on non-Chinese with a goal of 22 billion, ne uh, sorry, 18 billion next year. So the total for non-Chinese production is 28 billion doses. Let me say that again, 28 billion doses and only 1.1 billion were supposed to go to to to, to non to, to, to these Western markets. What's happened? So there's a series of I call limiting factors. First of all, we mentioned India, which now needs 1.8 billion doses for its own people. So that's uh, that's roughly speaking 75% of 1.2 billion people. So they therefore can't export. And then you see a series of problems of either J and J destroying doses or waste vaccines, which we put at the bottom, as you saw or heard overnight from the WHO. There are 14 USA states under 40% double vaccinated and five USA states single vaccinated. That's Bloomberg data. And the reason that's a problem is because those don't last forever. And if they're sitting there and being uh, going to waste, that's not finding its way elsewhere in the world to, uh, to markets that need them uh, deep, uh, deeply. You see the AU mentioning that Europe is supposed to give them uh, uh, doses, but nothing has been released to Africa as of earlier in, in July. So we, we then come on to the importance of, of Hong Kong. Ten years ago, there was no biotech industry in, in, uh, in China, and it was just really developed over the last 10 years in part through careful planning by the Chinese government and in part by the provinces you mentioned before. But I want to just point out two or three things on this slide. I'm sorry there's too many, too many words on the slide. But basically, the changes made in Hong Kong Stock Exchange in 2018, where they permitted IPOs of companies with no revenues, changed everything. And you saw by, since then, $13.5 billion into biotechs. By the end of last year, 28 biotech companies in Hong Kong Exchange alone had $90 billion in market cap. Follows it up more this year. And then we note some, you know, some different, uh, other exchanges, Chinex and Star in Shanghai, and also pre-profit companies were listed in Star last year. So think of the amount of money coming into this industry, uh, which was a startup really 10 years ago, and the importance of that in, in battling a, a global pandemic. Here are some individual um, uh, transactions. There's no reason to go through those. I just really point out on the first one, that this is that uh, the importance of relisting. There's certain options. Sometimes people use options to lift valuations in Shenzhen or Shanghai over Hong Kong. And the second point on here, the second bullet point is really a, a segue into Julia's presentation and also reaches out to what the minister was saying with Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect and also Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect. Again, um, again, you see linkages between all three of these, but all three are critical to form this. So basically Chinese production, despite what you hear from the Western press, is not led by China for vaccine production. These numbers are updated as of last week. And the total, uh, total dosage for China this year is 3.2 billion. And again, 5.3 billion next year. Again, that's re relative to 10 billion from the West this year and tw uh, 18 billion from the West next year. Now this doesn't include a very important joint venture, which we talk about a bit later, with the Fosun Biotech JV, which adds a billion production to, to, to China. And I'll talk about that again on a separate page. It's also worth noting, and some of the people on this, uh, this uh, today, this uh, webinar are actually investors in some of these. There are 35 Chinese vaccines under consideration, again, to draw more capital out of the stock exchanges to add more value and more doses to produce for the world. Here are seven uh, vaccines, six of which uh, I, I just point out the first three. Number one, number two, sorry, number one, number three, number four, you will know for the number of countries they're already in. You see the trials in the other ones. You also note that um, there are two that are still yet to be approved for many other countries. And uh, as importantly, we see um, mRNA vaccine is also now being trialed in Mexico. So again, a lot on the a lot in the pipeline, a lot to come forward, but a lot that needs to be financed through those stock exchanges. 
Chinese dosages themselves. So you see within China, China had administered 1.34 billion doses of vaccine domestically by the 8th of July, and it still aims, aims to have 75% of the population fully um, vaccinated by Q4 of 2021 versus what I just showed you in the USA um, where it's stuck, and obviously a, a huge discrepancy of 75% and, uh, and, and where they are in the US with 33% of Americans still no vaccine whatsoever. Um, this is slightly outdated, it's 37.4%. I guess there's a bigger number in the last page, but you get the, you get the picture here on, on the international basis. Despite all the progress locally, they've also made progress internationally. This is what's a game changer. So, so basically China can't possibly catch the West, at least in the near term, because you can't make up that difference from those large pharma companies. And by the way, those large pharma companies are a real market, a real market cloud again, which we talk about at the end. This page shows at the end of June, China has come up with a Belt and Road Vaccine Partnership Initiative, which involves 29 countries, 2.7 billion people, 35% of the world's population. And what we have on this page is, because we track numbers and, and financials, as you know from our prior work, um, the, the red dots are, those are direct loans from China. Uh, so unlike the USA and G7, China not only provides its vaccines to be manufactured in these countries, it also provides loans to these countries to help prop up their health infrastructure and also their S loans, central banks for the SMEs. So what you see in here are NBD loans. There's 9 billion of NBD loans, obviously just for the BRICS countries. And their AIB loans, you see, that's just for this year only. We have all the last year's data in the prior, in the prior point, uh, prior document. But again, once you see defined number of countries, uh, financial assistance both for healthcare infrastructure and also for SME lending to the, the local banks. Here are selected countries out of the 29 and relative populations, and you see that in some cases they have already established partners. But more importantly, what you see is there's very little production this year. So you might see all this press that says, gee, UAE is going to do 200 million. That's true. Not this year. It will be true. It will be true in the future. And some of the numbers on the right hand side will be much bigger in the future. But right now, they're not that big. So, again, China is uh, leading the world with vaccine diplomacy. Not true. China is trying to help the world in the mess that it's in. But they're not. They can't lead it because they don't have the numbers. I will add on this page, in my opinion, that re re Indonesia will be a regional player uh, in producing and Pakistan will be a regional player. And Pakistan has one of the world's leading labs in vaccine production historically. But just because you do uh, other vaccines doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean you convert that to COVID-19 production. And they've had difficulty doing that. Again, just do the numbers two times this for each one of these countries for the first dose of the uh, first first vaccine of this stuff. The numbers are incredible. These three countries are not part of the 29. And still look at this, uh, look at this, you see the size here. And there are going to be local manufacturing production facilities here. Serbia announced one overnight. Uh, Hungary's going to have one. Argentina's going to have one. But just these pages alone, these two pages here are 1.2 billion people. China's 1.4 billion people. That's 2.6 billion people, again, with local possibilities for vaccine production. Um, this page I want to talk about, but not really going through all, um, sorry, uh, yeah, I suppose uh, this is the vaccine partnership I talked about before. I don't know why we got the pages confused. Um, sorry, this is my, my secretary's error last night, but we can cover it. So the basic message is the, you, you see uh, as a nut, in a nutshell, because we're short of time anyway, that uh, the non-Chinese the non companies are going to have 28 billion doses of which 3.1% of their total production goes to foreign uh, foreign users, which is not a big number as an understatement. Uh, and Western vaccine manufacturers are planning to realize over 60 billion in 2021 revenues. When we looked at this number in September last year, we were estimating as with Credit Suisse of a 20 billion of a 20 billion number this year. It's, it's going to be 67 billion. We think it'll be over 100 billion industry next year. Again, we, we make the point that six Western jurisdictions can't have 90% 90, 90 of the surplus, while China has very little, uh, none of the surplus. But that, that said, it has committed just last earlier this week uh, through the Vaccine Alliance that they've uh, pledged 
550 million out of the total of 8.5 billion. So they've doubled the pledge to the rest of the world. But it's clear from these numbers that China can't bridge that WHO vaccine gap, even when including the production, the vaccine alliance. It's going to take a lot of time and if, to, to, to develop that sizably enough. So we wanted to make, make the point in closing, because it's a very short uh, window to do this, uh, that the Western countries need to, what we consider to tear down its exist, existing porous vaccine walls, which are permitting things like the Delta variation, variant and other variants, li loosen up their hold on those excess doses. And I'm uh, delighted to say that as we're watching CNN at three o'clock this morning when WH, head of the WHO made the same conclusion, I'm delighted our, confusion, our, our conclusion is aligned with the WHO. Thank you very much. Chris, back over to you. Hello. Thank you, Henry, uh, for I've lost you, Chris. Okay, I think Chris has dropped out, but oh, here he's back again. I've lost Chris. Thank you, Henry, for for uh, uh, a startling presentation. Um, some uh, interesting comments there about uh, how Western governments need to uh, get their act together a bit more in terms of stopping wastage uh, and uh, really break down some of those barriers. It was also interesting, I think, to see the role of the Greater Bay Area in raising finance uh, for uh, vaccine production, uh, particularly what's been going on with uh, the new regulations in the Hong Kong stock exchanges and elsewhere as uh, uh, concerns accepting uh, pre-revenue biomedical companies. Very, very important step and um, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, for those of you that want to, um, there'll be a lot of questions, I'm sure, for Henry's uh, section. For those of you that want to ask questions, you can please use the chat uh, uh, section at the bottom. Uh, there you can submit questions in text form there. Um, we will have a quick Q&A at the end of this event. Uh, we may not have time to answer all questions, but we will be sending questions to panelists uh, for their further attention. Um, and if you, Henry's email and Julia's will also be provided to you at the end of this uh, webinar. Moving on, I'm very pleased to welcome Julia Charlton, uh, the principal partner of Charlton's law firm in Hong Kong. Um, Julia uh, practices uh, capital finance. Uh, she advises regulators, financial uh, institutions, and listed companies on rules for the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and GEM markets. She is a senior fellow of the Hong Kong Securities and Investment Institute, so Hong Kong Securities and Futures Commission, uh, the Hong Kong Institute of Certified Public Accountants, and the Hong Kong Law Society, while Charlton's won uh, the, um, the Hong Kong Innovative Finance Award uh, uh, in Hong Kong last year. Uh, Julie will be talking about the relationship between Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area. Julia, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Um, Minister Yang, Stephen, my fellow panelists, Chris Alberto and Henry, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, Minister Yang, for your insightful and inspiring remarks. I'm sure everybody today is very excited by the opportunities offered by the Greater Bay Area. And it's such a pleasure to be with you to follow on from Alberto's amazing overview of the Greater Bay Initiative and, and Henry's quite stunning presentation on the Health Silk Road with insights as to how the Greater Bay Area played a useful role in the recent pandemic. My focus today is on the potential of Hong Kong within the Greater Bay Area, a matter of paramount importance to the future of Hong Kong. The big picture of the Greater Bay Area is this network of thriving cities, as we've heard, each with a focused specialization. And the Greater Bay Area aims to assemble the best in class in different areas, joining their strengths to work together. So the synergies of these elites will drive each to be more competitive. And this concept is at the core of the Greater Bay Area Initiative, integration of the area's key cities to work together seamlessly and friction-free. So what's Hong Kong's role in the Greater Bay Area? 
Well, there was a framework agreement signed in 2017, and it said that Hong Kong, was its role was to consolidate and enhance its status as an international financial, transportation and trade center, strengthen its st status as a global offshore renminbi business hub and an international asset management center, promote the development of its professional service and innovation and technology industries, and establish a center for international legal and dispute resolution services in the Asia-Pacific region. So really, the economic integration of Hong Kong, in my view, has been an ongoing process, which has been going on for a while. It's a natural um, extension of Hong Kong's traditional role as a trading and market entrepot linking China and the rest of the world. We shouldn't forget that historically, Hong Kong from the 50s to the 70s grew to be a manufacturing hub, and it was largely Hong Kong factory owners who drove the initial investment in factories in southern China in the wake of China's opening up from 1978. Following Deng Xiaoping's historic visit to Shenzhen in 1992, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and the Hong Kong capital market went on to play a pivotal role in listing eight shares of Chinese companies starting in 1993, and I was involved in that from 1992 onwards. This paved the way for the enormous investment in China's economy and the growth of China's own capital markets. So Hong Kong has many advantages. Well, it has this attractive business environment. The government has big markets, small government approach. Um, it imposes a low tax regime. There are only three kinds of direct taxes in Hong Kong. Profits tax, salaries tax, property tax, effective corporate tax rate is 15%, one of the lowest in the world. At the same time, we have high standards of anti-money laundering. The financial services sector is, they say, one of the most important, I would say the most important economic pillar of Hong Kong. The Hong Kong financial markets provide a range of well-regulated financial products to investors, and it has one of the most active stock markets in the world, with particular strength in IPOs. Even during COVID, the Hong Kong market achieved a historic high in terms of funds raised in the first quarter of this year, 13.9 billion US dollars, ranking third globally. It often ranks top globally in terms of funds raised, and as we heard from Henry, um, Hong Kong plays a, has played a huge role since 2018 in listing uh, pre-revenue biotech companies, a lot of them from China. It also started to list tech companies with weighted voting rights. Previously, that hadn't been allowed in Hong Kong, which paved the way for Alibaba and all those big companies to list in Hong Kong. I myself was deeply involved in that process as a member of the Hong Kong Listing Committee at the time, and I'd be very happy to take detailed questions on any of that later. So Hong Kong's geographical location, well, most people know this, but it's well placed as a transport and trade hub. It's location in the South Asian Pacific region um, and its sheltered natural port gives it many advantages for um, shipping activities. It's long served as an entrepot for mainland China and a transshipment port in the South Asian Pacific region. And its trade activities are also supported by its no tariff regime. Hong Kong Airport also makes a big contribution to Hong Kong's trade. In 2019, it was ranked the world's busiest cargo airport for the 10th consecutive year. The total cargo handled accounted for about 43% of Hong Kong's external trade. As an SAR of China, the world's most populated country and the, the world's second largest economy, Hong Kong is still a launch pad for many businesses um, from overseas who are looking at going into the Chinese market. Hong Kong was one of the first offshore markets to start renminbi business in 2004, and it currently has the largest pool of renminbi outside of China. Hong Kong has a well-established legal system and a judiciary based on rule of law, which makes Hong Kong a desirable location for operating businesses and international dispute resolution. In 2021, the, in an international arbitration survey, the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center is ranked the third most preferred and used arbitral institution in the world. Hong Kong has a well-educated and hard-working population, great universities with five of them ranked in the top 100 in the QS ranking. So all this leads me to be optimistic that Hong Kong will thrive in its intended role in the Greater Bay Area and is well-placed to be this central operational hub for the area. China's 14th five-year plan sets out a dual circulation economic strategy to make China less reliant on foreign imports, and Hong Kong has voiced proactive support for this plan. 
economic integration schemes between Hong Kong and the mainland are very much in line with this proposed internal circulation strategy. In particular, Stock Connect and Bond Connect, these connect schemes which target the needs of financial services within the mainland market and offshore, are consistent with this strategy of internal circulation. So what is Stock Connect? It's a mutual market access channel which allows Hong Kong and international investors to trade shares listed on the Shenzhen and Shanghai stock exchanges. That's called northbound trading. And Chinese investors can trade stocks listed on the Hong Kong exchange. Bond Connect operates in a similar way, although in relation to the bond market, and only northbound tra trading is implemented at the moment. I do see a number of clients like sovereign um, wealth funds and so on investing in bond connect through the um, in bonds in china through hong kong bond connect so following on from stock connect and bond connect the first connect scheme specific to the greater bay area is going to be the wealth management connect and that was announced in may last year and it could potentially launch in the second half of this year this will allow eligible mutual funds, bank deposits, insurance products, securities, and potentially also pension funds to be sold throughout the Greater Bay Area. All Hong Kong residents can be part of the scheme, while in the mainland it's those with a hukou in the Greater Bay Area who can participate. Through Wealth Management Connect, residents in the Greater Bay Area will be able to invest in Hong Kong wealth management products, and Hong Kong financial service providers will gain access to this market with a population of 72 million. It's proposed to be an aggregate overall quota initially of 150 billion RMB flow in each direction, and each individual can invest at 1 million RMB each. At the launch stage of the scheme, it will only be banks who will be authorized distributors. Products available will in, be in the low to medium risk category and must be governed by the laws of the retail jurisdiction where they're sold. Operational details are expected to be available soon as regulators in Hong Kong and China signed a memorandum of understanding in February this year to release their guidelines on the scheme. Wealth Management Connect is expressly intended to, to support domestic financial and fund management businesses, i.e fund management businesses in Hong Kong and the rest of the Greater Bay Area. Fund managers therefore have to set up funds domiciled here in order to take part in the scheme, so USITs and other offshore funds won't be part of the scheme. So fund managers are likely now to prioritize establishing Hong Kong or mainland domiciled funds to take advantage of this scheme. The Connect schemes create a critical mass of cross-border investors between Hong Kong and the Greater Bay Area, which is likely to boost, I think, the development of financial technology and AI. The cross-border element of Connect schemes may lead financial institutions to use technologies in the transaction processes, and frequent cross-border transactions are likely to drive the need for technology. The Greater Bay Area, particularly Hong Kong and Shenzhen, should be well placed to benefit from this connection. We have to remember that Hong Kong market and Shenzhen market together are just about, I think, third um, largest stock joint stock market in the world. If you take Hong Kong, Shenzhen and Shanghai together, they rival the US in terms of size. They're second only to the US. So this really should give rise to a symbiotic relationship between the advanced tech of Shenzhen and the developed financial services of Hong Kong. Shenzhen will have Hong Kong as a platform for the commercial application of their cutting edge tech, while the Hong Kong side can adopt and develop state-of-the-art financial tech applications. This synergy has the potential to drive the growth of the entire Greater Bay Area. Specifically for Hong Kong, as I've already mentioned, Hong Kong financial services providers will have access to investor capital from a region of 72 million, larger than, for example, the size of France or the size of the UK. The mainland and Hong Kong governments are working closely together to integrate their economic systems. But while this integration moves forward, the legal sector, which is closely intertwined with the commercial world, may also undergo rapid change. And obviously, this is a subject dear to my own heart, the legal arena. The Greater Bay Area Initiative will definitely impact Hong Kong's legal environment, especially in the business sector. The Greater Bay Area promotes cross-border commercial activities, and this surge in commercial activity is likely to lead to disputes and increased demand for dispute resolution. 
and the Greater Bay Area Initiative aims to support Hong Kong as an international dispute resolution centre. However, there will be challenges in the Greater Bay Area as it covers three different legal systems, China, Hong Kong and Macau. A framework agreement on legal exchange and mutual learning was entered into between Hong Kong and the People's High Court of Guangdong as part of an initiative in 2019, and that was aimed at strengthening legal exchange and collaboration in the Greater Bay Area. There's also details of the pilot measures for Hong Kong and Macau legal practitioners to obtain mainland practice qualifications, which were released in October last year. So this lets lawyers in Hong Kong and Macau with five years experience take exams in, in the Greater Bay Area and they would then be able to provide legal services in the nine municipalities of the Greater Bay Area on specified commercial matters. In other words, extending their legal license to a very large population. This will provide significant opportunities to Hong Kong and Macau lawyers as they will have a much bigger market for their legal services. It may also encourage Hong Kong entrepreneurs to start businesses in the Greater Bay Area as they'll be able to use Hong Kong legal services generally and in the event of a dispute. Opportunities aren't limited to individual lawyers. There are also some for law firms. Guangzhou has liberalized the requirements for Hong Kong law firms to form partnerships with Guangzhou law firms by removing the minimum capital injection requirement. This allows more cross-border partnerships to be formed, giving Hong Kong law firms greater opportunities to access the mainland market. In addition to the flow of talent and services, another policy focus is cross-border commercial disputes. The policy primarily focuses on mediation and arbitration. Mediation often leads to settlements, which may potentially be of benefit to litigants. The China and Hong Kong governments are promoting the use of these forms of dispute resolution, as well as facilitating the execution of proceedings in cross-border disputes. The Hong Kong and the mainland government signed an investment agreement in 2017 under SEPA, which provides a mediation mechanism for investment disputes. The mechanism aims to promote the use of mediation in cross-border investment disputes, allowing mainland investors to access Hong Kong mediation services, as well as letting Hong Kong investors appoint designated mainland mediation institutions as mediators to resolve investment disputes. Specifically, for the Greater Bay Area, a proposal was endorsed to set up a Greater Bay Area mediation platform, but this is still at a preliminary stage. Arbitration as a form of dispute resolution for commercial disputes is often preferred as it is conducted on a confidential basis. The mainland and Hong Kong governments signed a supplemental arrangement concerning mutual enforcement regarding arbitral awards. This detailed the reciprocal arrangements for enforcement of cross-border commercial disputes. For example, this arrangement allows simultaneous enforcement applications in both Hong Kong and the mainland. Previously, creditors could only enforce proceedings in one jurisdiction at a time. This mechanism provides better protection to creditors in relation to arbitral awards, as well as simplifying the procedures for enforcing an award, as successful enforcement is always a crucial concern. Although this policy doesn't specifically apply only to the Greater Bay Area, it may encourage commercial disputes within the Greater Bay Area to use Hong Kong to arbitrate disputes. Going forward, Hong Kong's common law system may be preferred by some international corporations as well as Hong Kong companies operating in the Greater Bay Area. The authorities are apparently exploring this possibility. In particular, there was a pilot measure implemented in Chiangai last October, allowing wholly owned Hong Kong enterprises in Chiangai to agree on the choice of applicable law when they enter into civil and commercial contracts even for wholly PRC-related matters, meaning they could use Hong Kong law for wholly PRC-related matters. This measure is expected to encourage the use of Hong Kong legal services, as well as encouraging Hong Kong companies to establish their businesses in Chiangai. The option to use common law in a business context could be an attractive feature for international companies. However, it's yet to be seen whether there will be further relaxations allowing the expanded use of Hong Kong law in the Greater Bay Area. It's clearly an important issue for Hong Kong to build on these exciting opportunities offered by increasing integration with China through close cooperation and the provision of legal services, while at the same time preserving Hong Kong's robust common law system. 
So what's the way forward for Hong Kong? Well, clearly, it's to integrate into and build on the business opportunities offered on the Greater Bay Area. And as many areas, but in many areas, this is still really at a conceptual stage. Certainly the COVID pandemic, I think, has delayed progress somewhat over the last 18 months. But it's very clear that the high-speed train has left the station and that Hong Kong finance and legal professionals are preparing to face the challenges of increased competition and so on, as well as to capitalize on the opportunities for being effectively part of a much larger market. I'll now hand over to the ever insightful Chris Devonshire Ellis to talk about the Greater Bay Area and the Belt and Road Initiative. Back to you, Chris. Julia, thank you for a really uh, uh, energetic speech. Uh, I think the Wealth Connect scheme uh, really, foreign financial institutions should be looking to set up in Hong Kong to access the immense amount of private wealth that is held in mainland China. Um, a statistic which I've just pulled up is that the, the uh, Greater Bay Area, the uh, per capita income uh, uh, as at today is 23,500 US dollars. It's a wealthy area in its own right. Uh, and I think a resurgence of interest in Hong Kong uh, is going to occur as a result of these uh, uh, really dynamic uh, uh, schemes. So foreign investors and financial institutions from around the world should not be discounting Hong Kong as a place to set up business and access that mainland Chinese wealth. Uh, those guys need help in what to do with their newfound fund, uh, new uh, wealth, and um, uh, international experts, financial experts and investors should be uh, should be making uh, steps to bang on the doors and look at how they can access that. Julia, thank you very much indeed. We'll see you again for the uh, panel questions. Thank you. Now, my, uh, I'm last but not least, uh, I'll be discussing the uh, Greater Bay Area uh, and the Belt and Road Initiative, but from the context of um, the SEPA agreement, uh, I'll be talking about that a little bit. Uh, double tax uh, uh, treaties and arrangements that both Hong Kong and China have. I'll be looking at uh, three trade agreements that uh, both Hong Kong and China have around the world. I'll be also discussing issues uh, related to uh, upcoming free trade agreements and the impact of China. The art negotiations uh, and involvement with free trade areas with ASEAN, the asset agreement, I'll be doing his involvement with the uh, Commission, uh, the, uh, uh, the CP, CPTPP, uh, BRICS, uh, Africa, and then I'll give a, a global overview of where China is. Now, we haven't really discussed uh, the China-Hong Kong SEPA arrangement very much. Uh, if we can just have that uh, slide back again, please. Um, there has been a lot of media attention uh, on uh, Hong Kong, uh, and uh, there's been some uh, unwarranted uh, uh, media headlines the one country, two systems uh, uh, has been broken. But that is not true at all. Uh, the one country, two systems uh, is complex. And of course, it's one country, three systems when you're talking about Macau as well. For the purpose of this, I'm going to discuss the uh, China-Hong Kong Closer Economic Partnership Agreement. Now, this is in place and a similar agreement with Macau because all of these areas, Hong Kong, Macau and mainland China, all have differing legal uh, tax and other systems in place. So to unify those, there need to be these sorts of agreements in position. The, um, the Hong Kong China SEPA originates back in 2003 and has been modified and extended and expanded many times since. Uh, it comprises four main areas, uh, and that is uh, Hong Kong China trading goods, all Hong Kong originated goods are zero tariff into China, and this includes specific sections such as for trade facilitation in the Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau, Greater Bay area. There's specific, specific sections which deal with that, and these contain the rules and regulations for selling uh, into mainland China from, uh, from Hong Kong and Macau. The second section of the SEPA agreement specifically deals with trade and services and includes preferential agreements recognition of professional qualifications, something Julia just touched upon. Um, there's also a third section, investment, again, preferential treatment for Hong Kong companies uh, investing into mainland China. Uh, the fourth section of the SEPA agreements are economic and technical 
cooperation, which includes 22 sectors uh, catering for uh, new developments issues such as digital, telecommunications, finance, SMEs, there are incentives there, the Belt and Road Initiative itself, which I'll discuss in a second, intellectual property, free trade zones, quality inspection of goods transiting between the two, accounting, law, tourism, and so on. So the Hong Kong SEPA agreement is a cornerstone of the Greater Bay Area. Uh, and if you require access to what that actually means and how Hong Kong companies can access China, then please ask uh, specifically Julia or Alberto later about, uh, about this. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Now, um, I'm going to skip through this a little bit. Um, Hong Kong has double tax treaties, uh, as does China. This is a list of the Hong Kong ones. Uh, now, just to those that are not familiar with how the, uh, they are important, is that DTA uh, provide tax incentives for specific bilateral trade, especially in service industries. Uh, and they can typically reduce corporate income tax rates uh, by use of various mechanisms, uh, can save up to 10% of CIT uh, applicable uh, profits uh, through use of such treaties. So it's interesting and useful to know where Hong Kong has such agreements. Um, uh, they are specific in nature, they vary from country to country, and are geared to mutual trade and investment interests. Um, a particular interest to uh, Hong Kong, you've got the country list there. Um, a recent one has, uh, has changed the investment landscape in Hong Kong somewhat, and will continue to do so. Uh, Hong Kong recently signed a, a double tax agreement with, uh, with Russia, and that is having the effect of uh, bringing Russian businesses into the territory and to access the mainland market from there. Um, China is also uh, using uh, DTA. The next slide, please. Thank you. And you can see I've, uh, I've partitioned those into different uh, areas, Asia, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, North America and the, uh, the Caribbean uh, region. Again, the same, the same thing applies. Uh, if you are from any of these countries and you intend to do business with China or you're in China, which includes foreign invested enterprises and you wish to uh, expand your reach overseas, then you should be looking at the China double tax treaties uh, and seeing what they contain and which areas uh, in service that can be specifically used to uh, enhance uh, and maximize the profitability of your uh, bilateral trade uh, uh, between China and these countries. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, Hong Kong also has free trade agreements, and as you can see, uh, I've listed them here. Uh, these provide, uh, as do the China free trade agreements, specific tariff reductions on itemized agreed products, and this can range into uh, uh, thousands of different products between countries, um, either eliminating uh, or reducing tariffs. Um, Hong Kong, just to, just to show how important this is for relatively, even for relatively small markets, um, Hong Kong established a free trade agreement with Georgia in the Caucasus uh, to the east of Europe uh, just a couple of years ago in 2018. Um, that free trade agreement resulted in Georgian wine exports to Hong Kong up just 9% the next year. But by the time the Georgian wine industry had got its act together and realized the benefits of a free trade agreement, uh, it rose 15% um, uh, the following year. So Georgian wine exports, just as an indication of how free trade agreements work, to Hong Kong. Uh, uh, received a significant boost as a result of this particular uh, uh, FTA. You can see the different countries there. Hong Kong also has FTA with ASEAN of regional interest and uh, region with Australia and New Zealand. And you can see the other uh, countries it has with uh, there. So if you're interested for, or from any of these countries, then you, you really should be looking at the Hong Kong FTA and what they have to offer. Uh, we'll move on to um, China, please. It's a China free trade agreements. Um, it doesn't look tremendously significant, um, uh, but it does include uh, ASEAN. And uh, increasingly, uh, there's moves being made into South America. You can see the South American countries there. Uh, yesterday, the Brazilian uh, ambassador to China uh, announced that uh, China and Brazil 
uh, a lead country in South America and the lead country in the Mer Mercosur uh, South American free trade bloc uh, announced that China and Brazil were working together to align their, um, their investment programs. That is going to lead to a potentially a free trade agreement between China and Mercosur, we'll have to see, but certainly enhanced trade between China and Brazil. Uh, Brazil is a significant market, of course. Now, the free trade agreements that China uh, has, uh, in the last 12 months, uh, China has, uh, has uh, posted um, continued export growth every single month. So they're working. Of the most traded items, uh, machinery and transport make up the 48% uh, of China's export uh, markets. Uh, electrical equipment, 14%. Telecoms, 12%. Um, growth, interestingly, has been, despite the uh, political problems, uh, the, the, the major growth of China's exports over the past 12 months has been with the European Union, the United States, Japan, UK, Mexico, Brazil, I mentioned earlier, the Philippines, and France. Um, China is also close, very close, to agreeing a free trade agreement with the Gulf Cooperation Council, which gives it uh, access to the Middle Eastern markets. Right, now we're going to drill down a bit further now. We'll take a look at uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, please, in the next slide. There we go. Um, now, uh, RCEP is on top of some existing free trade agreements that China has, specifically with Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and South Korea, but it is different. Um, it has not yet been ratified. Um, there are protocols in place to get the uh, RCEP agreement uh, up and running. It's expected that that will happen sometime next year. Um, but the RCEP uh, provides uh, stronger rules of origin, um, and particularly on uh, new technologies such as e-commerce, and it's being phased in over 20 years. So uh, we need to keep an eye out on what happens and what gets relaxed in terms of uh, what people can sell and trade uh, under RCEP uh, uh, free trade uh, as we go on. Um, uh, RCEP itself, as a body, includes 30% of the world's total population, 30% of global GDP, and includes 30% or has 30% of global exports. So it's a significant uh, free trade uh, area. Um, the members of uh, RCEP, their GDP annual growth rate average is 5.2%. Uh, and that compares with a GDP average growth rate of 2.3% for the EU and 2.4% for the USMA, the United States, Mexico and Canada. Um, uh, and as I said, uh, with growth rates double out of, uh, more than double out of what you're seeing in the West, uh, RCEP is a specific agreement. And as I mentioned, it's expected to be fully ratified uh, sometime next year. Uh, next slide, please. We go on to the, uh, the CPTPP, um, which has uh, been gaining a lot of headlines uh, recently. Um, China is not part of this, um, uh, neither is Hong Kong. Um, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, you can see the countries involved uh, there. Um, China has announced interest in it. You can see its yellow uh, uh, status there, and you can see the, the blue members of it. Um, the UK uh, has uh, applied to join uh, through the somewhat tenuous um, uh, acquisition it has of the Pitcairn Islands, which are the, in the Asia Pacific. Um, but nonetheless, we can see what the CPTPP is. Um, my, um, my opinion on this, it's not yet uh, been, uh, the CPTPP is in effect, but uh, the UK's uh, accession to that has still yet to be ratified. Um, it's really a Japan uh, uh, and uh, US and potentially UK-led uh, uh, bloc, so high-tech, uh, and in part is political, uh, I think, uh, a political reaction to the development of uh, RCEP. Um, it's designed, I personally feel, uh, in terms of uh, keeping China away from some of the high-tech products in the, uh, in, in the, uh, the top-end markets there. Um, it does have higher standards of IP than uh, RCEP, um, and I think issues, there it has some issues which were not in China's favour as regards membership qualifications, such as um, 
information that has to be provided and shared with other members uh, on the financing of uh, state-owned enterprises and their financial uh, records. Uh, it has to declare, member states have to declare state intervention, their state intervention in specific markets. Um, so some of this is not really uh, so attractive to, uh, to China. Um, we feel, uh, I think as a firm, that China will not become part of the CPTPP, uh, but it will represent uh, an Asia base for Japan, the United States and other economies, possibly the UK to come into later. Um, so um, uh, our comments on that. Now I'd like to move on now, please, to the Eurasian Economic Union, um, the EAEU. Um, it's not well understood, but China actually signed a free trade agreement with uh, the Eurasian Economic Union in 2018. Uh, discussions, negotiations on tariffs applicable uh, are still underway. So at the moment, there are no tariff reductions between uh, uh, China and the EAEU, but it is coming down the pipeline. Um, in terms of um, size, it has 5% of global GDP dominated by Russia, um, market size of 180 million. Um, now, Russia-China trade, both uh, President Xi Jinping and uh, Vladimir Putin have expressed uh, a desire to see that double by 2024 to 200 billion US dollars. I think that the EAEU is going to be part of that. Um, it, um, it also has had uh, some significant impact on Russia with the sanctions placed, placed upon the country. Uh, Russia is now starting to turn its two-headed eagle to the east and has been making inroads into countries in Asia. Uh, the EAU has uh, or, or signed off its first free trade agreement with Vietnam four years ago. And to give you an indication of the success of that, uh, trade went from uh, basically zero uh, to $10 billion in two years. Um, so it signifies that uh, uh, Russia is moving uh, ahead with that. Um, I can, uh, as you can see also from the slide, um, uh, several other FTA with the EAU, including with India, are currently under negotiation. And I think that this block, which China already has signed uh, with tariff agreements yet to kick in, is going to become a significant uh, player uh, within the next two or three years. So coming down the pipeline, the China trade uh, with the EAU is going to become significant. All right, we'll, uh, we'll move on, please. Thank you. I just want to talk about a little bit about uh, Africa. Again, there's, um, uh, China uh, was specifically involved in the negotiation of the African continental free trade area, which came into effect at the beginning of this year, 1st of January this year. China was behind that, driving it forward. And what it's done is it's, uh, it's eliminated um, uh, tariffs, intra-African tariffs on goods traded between African uh, countries uh, to uh, to zero or, or significantly reduce them. Um, that means that you can now source goods from all over Africa, take them to one particular uh, free trade zone or special economic zone of which China has invested about 50 to 60 in Africa alone, and then um, take them to ports, perhaps marry them with Chinese or other goods, and then uh, re-export them back to China or other markets or resell them back onto the African uh, uh, market. So Africa is, um, is a growing uh, area of interest for China. Um, now, although China doesn't have a free trade agreement with uh, the AFCFTA, it does have, and signed off earlier this year, a double tax agreement with Mauritius. Now, Mauritius has uh, played for the past uh, uh, two decades a significant role uh, in, the, um, in India, uh, bilateral trade and source uh, also needs to source uh, low value uh, goods and cheaper uh, uh, workers and uh, Africa is on its way to being urbanized. So there's a, a little update on what's happening with Africa. 
And we'll look at the next slide, please. Uh, okay, the, uh, the BRICS, um, it's not a free trade area, but it is highly influential. As you can see, it comprises uh, Brazil, um, which is the lead nation of South America's Mercosur free trade bloc. So it has uh, a specific relevance to, uh, to China. It includes Russia, the lead nation of the Eurasian Economic Union, India, which is the lead nation of SARC, the South Asian free trade area, and South Africa, one of the primary and wealthiest members of the African free trade, continental free trade agreement I just spoke about. So although it's not a free trade agreement in its own right, it is a specific um, uh, block which China is able to uh, uh, influence and work together with in terms of cementing uh, global trade, uh, infrastructure development, and the possibility of, um, of future DTA and FTA coming down the pipeline. Um, just to give you an indication, uh, the BRICS uh, uh, that, that equals 23.2% of global GDP, 42% of the global population, and it gives a platform for China to discuss, uh, as it does with the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, matters of trade and security with India. The two countries don't always get on, but the BRICS is a platform for them can, to do so. And I would encourage you, if you're looking at uh, where free trade opportunities are and are going to come from within the GBA and China itself, then the BRICS is one area that you should be looking at. We'll move on, I think, now to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, now, I'll just put this up to, um, to indicate uh, we all are aware that China and the European Union have frozen um, their bilateral investment treaty. Um, that was, although it made a huge amount of headlines, it was, a, uh, in the grand scheme of things, a, a fairly minor treaty. It didn't really amount to a great deal, um, although there were some protections in place. Uh, but here we can see the extent of the uh, BRI uh, into the EU. All of these countries have signed uh, MOU with the, uh, with the BRI. Now, our own research, a decent share, suggests that um, countries on a global basis that have signed MOU with China's BRI have seen their overall exports rise uh, by about 5% more over the past two years than countries that did not sign a BRI uh, MOU. So there is some impact being felt. Um, China tends to view as a soft power countries that have agreed uh, uh, BRI. It is influential in terms of getting things done, and uh, facilitating trade and so on and so forth. It is there. Um, it's also important to note that China-Europe uh, rail freight doubled in 2020. Um, it signs that it's gonna double again so that connectivity uh, is, um, uh, is there, it's going to remain, and it's growing. Uh, that can be borne out by um, Austria's uh, rail cargo group, uh, their rail, uh, Austria's uh, rail cargo group, uh, their rail volume uh, to China doubled last year, as did uh, Metrans, who, who operated 930 trains in 2020, um, uh, up from 426 in 2019 sending 30,000 TU. So the EU, despite the politics, the EU-China trade is very much alive and well. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and the new uh, uh, gl China uh, Global Europe Connectivity, which I just announced this morning, um, I think combined will make supply chains uh, even, more, uh, even more dynamic. So the, uh, uh, the EU and China uh, are definitely not decoupling. We'll just summarize now the final slide. Um, what I've got here is to show you not all of the world's free trade agreements, but some of the most prominent ones. Uh, you've got the EAEU there, the uh, Russian-led bloc. You can see uh, RCEP. You've got the um, African Free Trade Agreement I uh, commented on, the Gulf Cooperation Council, SARC, the Indian bloc. Mercosur, I discussed, I think is going to become increasingly uh, on, uh, on the radar for, uh, for businesses in uh, China and Hong Kong. And you can see the European Union and, um, and the USMCA. So to summarize, um, uh, what I really want to say is that China and Hong Kong have been extremely active in using double tax uh, treaties and free trade agreements to contractually engage in trade with the BRI as a route and infrastructure provider. 
um, future FTA agreements are key to studying how the trade geopolitics are impacting Asia and China and elsewhere. And again, that infrastructure uh, is designed to support those. China has cemented South Asia with the RCEP agreement and is in a process of connecting Central Asia to South Asia uh, through the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, this is occurring with other markets and especially uh, widening trade incentives to do so for Hong Kong and the GBA to become involved in new markets in Africa, Russia, Central Asia, even Central, uh, Central America, South South America. The Middle East and Mercosur countries of South America will also be drawn into this, as I just mentioned, um, and examining where the trade potential lies, looking at where China is negotiating free trade agreements and DTA, I think is key to understanding where these new trade corridors and supply chains are opening and why this is happening. Um, conducting research into this, I think, is going to be paramount for businesses looking forward as to the new uh, era of global trade uh, with significant market demographics uh, changing. The decoupling from uh, the US and the EU uh, uh, rhetoric is going to be replaced by a larger, farther reaching China in terms of global trade uh, and China's ability to have negotiations and continuing interest in world free trade areas, together with free trade agreements and DTA built on the back of BRI, BRI infrastructure is setting the stage for a new area of free trade on a global basis. RCEP is a major part of this, as is China as a regional hub and the Greater Bay Area as an important financial and trade hub as one of the main three hubs uh, that China has together with the Yangtze River Delta and the Beijing Tianjin uh, area. So I just wanted to give you a global overview of where we are with China, free trade, and uh, uh, trade incentives through double tax agreements. Uh, this is how it's going to be looking. So thank you very much for that. I think we shall now open it up to um, panel for quick q and I know we are running over, um, so we're just gonna run through four questions. I know that people have been submitting questions and we will be providing those to relevant panelists uh, via email. Um, you will also have uh, on a slide uh, to show there uh, uh, down below, uh, copies of their individual email addresses. So uh, we're open and transparent, and please feel free to ask any of my esteemed colleagues uh, questions that uh, you may wish. We have time for four. Um, Hi, Chris, you dropped out for a moment. Could you please repeat the question? Okay, sorry about that. Question for Henry. Um, how can ASEAN, CIS, Western, and other international businesses access the Health Silk Road, um, finance, and markets via the Greater Bay Area? Hi, Henry, it doesn't seem like we can hear you right now. I'll, I'll move on while we're having connectivity problems with Henry. Um, I'll move on to Julia. Um, uh, Julia, can you hear me there? Yes, I can, thanks. Okay, good. All right, okay, we'll come back to Henry in a second. Uh, Julia, building corridors between Hong Kong and the uh, Greater Bay Area, how will professionals be encouraged to relocate to South China? What are the incentives and motivations for them to do so? Well, to actually relocate, I think that's, that's really going to be a process of osmosis. I don't think it's going to happen overnight. Um, there will be relaxations on visas and so on. There's, there's a whole raft of um, initiatives that have been announced about, um, make, for example, vehicle registration, Hong Kong vehicles being allowed to drive over to the border without special number plates, provided they use a certain route. 
um, visa applications will be relaxed. There is a special scheme to allow young um, entrepreneurs from Hong Kong to get grants for their startup businesses to go and work in, um, particularly in the Chen Hai area, but also elsewhere in the Greater Bay area. Um, there is um, schemes for young people to go and work there. There's the legal schemes, which I've talked about in terms of increased market access for lawyers. Uh, there's also similar schemes for engineers and for other professionals, which is really building on what's been going on for a long time with SEPA, I think. It's also possible for all Hong Kong residents to be, buy property in the Greater Bay Area on exactly the same terms as um, local residents in the Greater Bay Area. So there's no restrictions on buying property. But I don't think there will be a mass exodus. I think it will be more a process of osmosis that people will decide it's better for them to move there. Healthcare, education gets better and better. And of course, I think many mainlanders have come to Hong Kong and will continue to do so. And frankly, they add vibrancy and know-how and um, amazing connections in the mainland to Hong Kong's economy. So I think that whole process will simply continue rather than happening with a big bang. Okay, Alberto mentioned uh, earlier that, uh, Julia, that uh, uh, it would be possible uh, to travel uh, around the uh, the GBA uh, in mass transit and high-speed rail uh, for apparently two, two hours. So do you think that it will turn into a commuter belt? Will people travel into mainland China and these cities and return to Hong Kong uh, in the evening for work? Definitely, definitely. And in fact, some people already commute um, from Shenzhen to Hong Kong. Um, in fact, school children come to school. It was one of the exemptions during COVID that they were allowed to go back and forth over the border. These school children who actually travel over the border every single day to go to school. So undoubtedly, um, that will become more and more integrated. And we have high speed, speed rail linking you know, Hong Kong railway station with the mainland. So it's going to be incredibly quick to be able to do that and very exciting. Okay, great opportunities for, um, for real estate companies, I think. Uh, Henry, are you back? Uh, I still can't uh, hear Henry. I'll, I'll move on to Alberto while we try and uh, resolve that. Um, Alberto, China's dual circulation system, um, how does that relate to the Greater Bay Area and how does this system also impact Hong Kong and Macau? Uh, sure. Uh, for those not familiar with the term uh, dual circulation, you can imagine this as two intertwined and connected uh, circles. On the one hand, you have China's uh, determination to move up the value chain and be less dependent on FDIs and uh, uh, critical components. And on the other circle, you have obviously by doing so, China will give full play uh, to a huge domestic market, uh, uh, giving uh, more internal growth. So in, in both circles, really there are opportunities for, for foreign companies. And um, uh, referring to a word Mr. Minister Yang said before, he mentioned pioneer. And um, uh, what I can see in the GBA is the GBA is really <clears throat> is the pioneer in terms of exploring uh, this uh, uh, China manufacturing uh, 2.0, go up the value chain and at the same time create some wealth for people in, uh, in the region. And just to give you an example about the sector, which I think is very, very important and, and the statement to this, uh, to this cause is, uh, it's for example, the new energy uh, vehicle uh, supported by all this 5G uh, infrastructure, uh, particularly in, uh, in Shenzhen, uh, whereby you have China moving up the value uh, chain, creating a lot of new opportunities for local as well as Chinese companies, and at the same time, create a better uh, living environment and making uh, uh, quite a few uh, people rich uh, in the process. Uh, so I think pioneering is where the GBA is, creating opportunities still for both foreign companies and uh, local companies alike. Okay, thank you. Henry, are we back with you? I hope so. Does that work? All right, Henry, good to hear you. All right, um, Henry, how can ASEAN, uh, the CIS and EAU companies, Western and other international businesses access the Health Silk Road via the Greater Bay Area? What are the key access points of access and market entry, raising finance, uh, being able to get into the market, sir? How does that work? 
it already has been working very strongly, as you see. I would look at several different ways. One, within the greater Bay area, I would certainly look at pre-IPO work. I mentioned there are 35 vaccines under consideration. That's all pre that's all that's all VC work, pre-IPO work, following on with IPOs in a, in a public setting. That's point number one. Point number two is I would look I would look because I'm personally looking at those 29 vac countries for vaccine hubs, which I think will all be, raise fresh capital, and many of those will be done on a PPP basis for local for local markets for uh, so you could actually make some profits out of that locally for country, companies there as well as involvement from a PPP point of view. That's the 29 countries so far. What is not, the 29 countries is not, are not involved in Africa yet. And we know from a conversation President Xi had with Macron and with Merkel last week, which you alluded to briefly, Chris, in your discussion, where, where Macron certainly welcomed future investment and from China into publicly and into France. There was also discussion about how that can be built out with Africa, with Germany and uh, and China and uh, um, France in, in, if you will, similar sort of structures as we saw those 29 countries with their free vaccine. For example, we know Ethiopia is already well along its way to doing something there. Egypt's well along its way. So I think there are lots of different ways to look at investment. And I look at this as a very, very unique opportunity for investors globally, and I'm going to put my money where my mouth is by investing in some of these in some of these local uh, local um, vaccine manufacturers and or um, equipment manufacturers in any of these countries because I think they have to take the view the West is not going to be there to help them, and they must get control of their own countries. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you, Henry, for that. Um, so. Um, Opportunities, and um, let's perhaps not buy on the, on the West to uh, bail us out all the time. Uh, I've got one last question uh, before we uh, we wrap up. It's to all of you. Um, U.S. President Joe Biden has uh, has announced a uh, a minimum 15% global CIT rate. What are the implications for Hong Kong and the GBA? Shall I go first on this? Please. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't think that the global corporate tax rate at 15% would have a significant impact on Hong Kong. The current corporate tax rate, effective rate here, is 15% on Hong Kong source income. But of course, if the basis of taxation, that's source of profits, were to be changed, that could be more significant for Hong Kong. But I think the worry is that the 15% might be the thin end of the wedge, and that you know these amounts will be ratcheted up which would affect, I think, Hong Kong's attractiveness vis-a-vis -vis elsewhere in the Greater Bay Area by narrowing the gap in tax differentials. But of course, it would also affect other parts of the Greater Bay Area, such as the low tax regime areas of Qianhai, Nansha, and Hongqin. Uh, but I don't think overall it would have a very significant impact, certainly not at 15%. Okay. Alberto? Uh, yeah, when I ask uh, clients and uh, other parties interested in the GBA, uh, tax used to come up quite often in the past. But to be honest, recently, I don't think tax is, is a major concern. Um, in the GBA area, you have three corporate, different corporate taxes. You've got 12% in, in Macau. You've got 165 uh, in, uh, in Hong Kong and 25% in China. Without all the reductions, uh, effective corporate rate is much less uh, than that. Um, so I think uh, iTech is 15% uh, in GBA, so still very attractive. But again, I don't think that will hinder any potential investments uh, into the area. Okay. All right. Well, look, on that note, I think we're going to wrap up this uh, webinar. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Stephen Perry, uh, uh, the chairman of the 48 Group, for his kind words at the beginning, and Mr. Mr. Wang. Uh, Xia Guang, the minister who uh, gave an introductory speech, very valuable words. Um, uh, Julia, thank you very much for your uh, dynamic uh, 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 and energetic speech. Henry, your data, as always, first rate and uh, really uh, provocative um, uh, figures there. And Alberto, um, a great introduction. So thank you very much uh, to all of you uh, for uh, lending your uh, expertise and uh, valuable time so that we can uh, we can help reach a better understanding and to all our participants for joining us uh, today 
Um, we are working on a, a, a short uh, on, on another event, which will be on the REITs, uh, and we'll be following this particular GBA event through with um, uh, similar uh, formats for the Yangtze River Delta and uh, the Jijingjing uh, area of Beijing and Tianjin in North China. We'll then expand that out into uh, countries such as Singapore, ASEAN, and uh, developments elsewhere throughout the uh, Asian region. Thank you very much for listening to us and um, uh, your uh, your participation. Uh, very, very, very welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you for joining today. Thanks all, thank you. Thank you. As we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, any questions that were, we were unable to answer today, I know there was a lot, will be followed through up by email. If you would like to direct any of your questions to any of our topic speakers here, please feel free to do so. The contacts are online. Or if you have any general questions, you can direct them to me as well. So as Chris said, thank you everyone for joining and thank you to all our speakers for their enlightening exploration of the GPA. So we hope to see you all at one of our events in the future. We do hope diverse events each month on the range of topics. So you can visit us by scanning the QR code here or emailing me or visiting us at www.dazanshira.com. Thank you everyone today and um, see you next time. Right. Thank you. Thank you.